Thanks a lot. So again, thanks for having us um, and allowing us to present the, the best toolbox ever. <laughs> so the, the Brain Electrophysiological Recording and Stimulation Toolbox, which was designed to increase objectivity, reliability, and reproducibility in non-invasive brain stimulation research. Most kudos go to Ume, who's the architect of this toolbox. So I'm just going to introduce the, um, the idea behind it uh, and the framework, and then Ume is going to take you into the practical um, applications. First, uh, conflicts of interest. So I have none. Uh, Ume suggests that he's head of software development at the Sync to Brain Company, which is developing the, the BOSS device for real time EG trigger stimulation, which we use here. Um, the, the best toolbox is open source and independent of um, specific legacy hardware devices, um, but uh, we are eager to, to make it compatible with as many devices as possible. Right. So uh, in today's demo, we'll use um, the hardware that's available in our lab, <clears throat> but we're happy to support you in setting up the best books in your lab with the hardware that you have available. So to get started, um, it's, it's important to remember like how many different techniques and protocols we have available in modern non-invasive brain stimulation research. There are the online protocols that allow to, to quantify excitability and connectivity to the field, um, ongoing or task-related um, brain activity to modulate uh, the level or the timing of brain activity, and offline approaches to facilitate or inhibit uh, cortical excitability, outlasting the stimulation itself, and modulating cortical plasticity. And uh, typically, as outcome measures, we have not only behavior and perceptual measures, but um, EMG, EEG, fMRI, you name it, so all those different imaging modalities that we can um, use in a non-invasive fashion with different um, uh, spatial and temporal resolution to investigate the human brain and its responses to a stimulation. And we combine them with another, and we can, can combine them with different um, brain stimulation tools, including uh, TMS, TES, or nowadays also brain ultrasound stimulation. And this can be done in a consecutive fashion to measure the offline effects of the stimulation on a um, uh, concurrent fashion to measure the immediate response of the brain to the stimulation. Um, and using the ability to bring together uh, brain stimulation and imaging and electrophysiology, uh, we can also go for brain state dependent brain stimulation, which means that we're not treating the brain, uh, the brain as a black box anymore, um, so stimulating irrespective of what's going on in there. But we use it as the, or treat it as the dynamic system it actually is and take into account the brain state at the time of stimulation, which might give rise to different outputs depending on when you stimulate. So for an open loop brain state independent stimulation, we just have to trigger our stimulator at any time independent brain activity in a randomized fashion. For brain state dependent stimulation, we might take into account the brain state. We um, for example, an EEG signal and looking at a particular amplitude and phase of target frequency and we analyze it in real time, we can configure and trigger the stimulator um, at a certain time. Now, this is still open loop until we close it and we actually modify the brains that we're monitoring. Uh, this is what we are playing for the future. The, the open loop, open loop brain state dependent brain simulation is what we're doing already right now. Now, Having all those sophisticated approaches on the one side, um, we also have some um, uh, dangers, basically, for um, the field of non-invasive brain stimulation and actually other fields alike, um, threatening the objectivity, reliability, and validity of the research. Right. Um, so we have a reproducibility uh, crisis in, in many fields, and non-invasive brain stimulation is uh, is not spared. And when we talk about this, we talk about the, the three classical principles, objectivity, reliability, and validity. So just briefly, objectivity means that the results of an experiment should be independent of external conditions, such as the experiment, uh, experience or the particular behavior of the person that is conducting, analyzing, or interpreting it. The reliability means that the results of an experiment should be stable across repetitions conducted multiple times and consistent within an experiment given that the value of the dependent variable is actually not changing. And then there's validity, referring to the fact that the results of the experiment 
should reflect the causal impact of an independent variable of interest, the cause, and the dependent variable of interest, the effect. And this should be unaffected by confounding factors. So how to improve this, um, uh, or this trinity, uh, which builds upon each other, and objectivity and reliability are important for reproducible research, but validity in addition to have sustainable scientific discovery, because you can also reliably measure something um, that's completely irrelevant or wrong <laughs> again and again. So what can we do to increase them? Uh, to increase objectivity, we should use standardized procedures for standard protocols. We can automate experimental procedures to avoid human errors and subjective decisions, and we can automate data processing and analysis for the same reason. To increase reliability, we should perform the experiments according to the highest technical standards and monitor the data quality online to make sure that we've actually reported what we wanted. We need to document all technical and procedural details to allow exact replication attempts and to often share those protocols, those for data collection, but also for processing and analysis. Finally, to increase validity, it already helps to avoid confounds like order and position effects while try randomization, that's the basics. But then, of course, to design control conditions to rule out confounding peripheral and off-target stimulation and provide proof of target engagement um, that is a classical manipulation check where simulations in new imaging. So the latter two here are um, not just to be um, attacked by technical um, implementations. So here we need to go into experimental design and make sure that the entire chain of causation from the application of NIPS to the actual measurement of a dependent variable is complete and that no confounding factors are explaining the results instead. And if you're interested to go uh, into this rabbit hole of causality here, um, I guess I have a written piece on that. Um, but all the other aspects actually of, uh, of mentioning, they can be solved with the technical implementation. And this is what we wanted. One tool to rule them all all the devices, all the protocols. And I was happy when Umar Hassan joined my lab um, and with his um, engineering and uh, programming skills, I could actually tackle this adapt. So the features we wanted to have in this um, brain electric, uh, electrophysiological recording and stimulation toolbox, the best toolbox, are flexible but user-friendly and easily accessible interface, the ability to design, execute, manage, and share experiments uh, to adjust existing but also design novel um, simulation protocols flexibly uh, to be able to assess the results online for monitoring of data quality and to have automatic storage and documentation of all the protocol parameters, the annotations, the real-time data and results so that never again information gets lost and cannot be recovered a year later. And um, based on the research we are interested in ourselves, we also wanted to have real-time and close-loop capability to do brain state dependent applications. So we decided to implement this uh, platform independent and this open source toolbox, but in a method environment to integrate with existing toolboxes. Uh, for example, we're using internally the, the field trip um, data structure uh, and, and separate functions for analysis. Uh, we can access SPM functions, use the magic toolbox um, to uh, control uh, TMS machines and um, several uh, APIs that were has written uh, to uh, communicate with the BOSS device or the new fast TUS device, for example. And Java helps to um, implement the advanced graphical features in the GUI. The protocols currently available cover basically all the standards that you have in, in TMS EMG research, so hotspot search, MEP threshold hunting in a closed loop fashion, MEP measurements, pair pulse and blue coil measurements, dose response curves, RTMS interventions. But then also the combination with EG for um, domestic work potentials, um, rest and state EG analysis to inform, for example, EG um, uh, triggered brain stimulation, also basic ERP applications, um, TMS fMRI synchronization, uh, TUS parameter planning, and so forth. So, and, and this list will be uh, updated uh, again and again. Now, a few words on the um, input and output interfaces so that the Press toolbox um, is the, the center of the experimental setup, receives inputs from a variety of different systems, 
um, the modalities like EMG, EG, principles of fMRI, work on that. Also, the, from the new navigation system, we can get the code positions, etc. And the different input types, those that are uh, they have a bit longer delays and are jittered, um, where software-based data buffers, um, for example, everything that can fit into the field trip real-time um, buffer can be used, but it might not be really real-time compatible because there are uh, delays and jitters. And then with those short and consistent delays where really digital data streaming, for example, UDP data protocols directly from EG systems like the active chamber on the one system, why are our real-time um, computer and the bus device to the best toolbox? On the output side, um, different modalities, TMS, TS, also um, peripheral electric stimulation, transcranial ultrasound stimulation, and eventually also feedback to the navigation system, setting new targets, and we're integrating also the, the robot to um, allow fully automated closed loop um, output search. Also here with more or less time critical parameters, if we set um, configurations, stimulation intensity, frequency, and so forth on the stimulators, this happens usually via serial communication, um, which is a bit slower, but there are also hardware delays on the um, device side, so that's not a problem. Um, and for time critical uh, triggering of the actual stimulation, um, TTL pulses are used. That depends on your on your setup, whether you send them with a bit more delay and data from your host PC or via a proper input output module, either in the BOSS device or in more, uh, low budget open source microcontrollers like Arduino or Raspberry Pi that allow like high precision triggering. So with a closed loop here, uh, we can configure stimulation, um, stimulate with TMS, TS, TUS, record EG and MEG, get the information, make decisions, and so on and so on. There's this graphical user interface, Uma is going to get you into in detail, um, which allows you to design experiments and protocols and conduct those and get online um, feedback uh, regarding the results uh, to monitor data quality if um, desired. But of course, you can also switch off those um, online results uh, to completely blind the experimenter. And there's a lot of documentation that helps you to get started. Um, there will also be a forum to um, ask questions in, uh, on GitHub. And of course, um, if you need help to set up um, the best toolbox at, at your site, in your lab, um, with your specific hardware, don't hesitate to contact Umer. Uh, he's, he's happy to, to help you out. So um, without any further ado, I would now like to um, and over to Umir. I'm going to stop screen sharing. And so we're now like moving from the office to the lab. Just yes. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me, Till? Yeah, I can hear you. It's fine. Thanks. Um, I will start sharing my screen now. Okay. My screen is being shared, right? Yes, I do see the Best Toolbox website. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Umair Hassan. I am a PhD student in uh, TILS lab. I will be giving demonstration about the Best Toolbox uh, software, and then we will uh, move to the lab uh, demonstration. My colleagues, Dr. Tolika Nandi and Stephanie Enor will also join us today in the lab demonstration. So I have shared my screen and you are seeing Best Toolbox website. So content-wise, I will be taking you from how to download and, and install uh, Best Toolbox software from GitHub, then how to run it for the first time, and then I will give further introduction and prepare some experiment with you uh, that we will then eventually run in, in the later part of this webinar. So here on the website page, on the home page, you see this second page, which says download and setup. Once you go there, from this here point, you can land on this page, which will take you to the release of best toolbox on GitHub. And from here, you can find this zip files. You can also, otherwise, if you have a GitHub client installed, 
You can also uh, give the SSH addresses from the GitHub repository and download it. After you have this zip folder, you can unzip it. I have already downloaded that zip folder and unzipped it already. And here lies the source code of Best Toolbox. Now that's all you need to do when you want to download it from the GitHub. There are no additional steps after that you have downloaded it. Now the next step is to basically start using it. In order to use it, uh, first of all, you need MATLAB because it's a MATLAB based toolbox at the moment. And uh, right now I have a MATLAB opened on my screen. Uh, it's a 2017B version. In principle, you can use any version, uh, which is beyond 2013. Uh, and uh, but it, there are some limitations described on the website for certain kind of hardware settings. So as soon as uh, you have MATLAB open, you can then copy the path of this folder where you have unzipped and all of the source code is sitting. You can then use this command as also described on the best toolbox website to add it to your path of your MATLAB environment. And uh, I, I will not do it. I have already set it up before. And uh, you can also, after executing this command, you can also give a save path command that will save everything that you have added to the path up till now. And you are basically ready to start using the best toolbox. Now, in order to open the best toolbox application best toolbox uh, also have a graphical interface as well as the, the programs and functions that can be used standalone without the graphical interface but uh, we recommend the use of the graphical interface so it's a very simple command as uh, explained by the name of best toolbox best like in all capital words and you type on the command window and enter a graphical interface will open up which is the best toolbox graphical user interface. Now on the screen, you see some empty areas and some areas are filled and a lot of buttons. I will go through all of the buttons basically and explain what are these modules. As still have already explained that there are several hardware devices that are, uh, that are compatible with best toolbox. We will also learn how to set those up and then eventually we will use them during our lab demonstration for a particular set of hardware devices. So on this uh, interface, you see an experimental control module and on the middle, you see an empty protocol design module. And on the very right side, you see a results window module. Uh, on, on the left side, this is the parent uh, hierarchical structure of the toolbox you can create multiple sessions inside one experiment and multiple uh, high level brain stimulation protocols inside each session and uh, there thereby you can populate your experimental design uh, experiment and the subject code are important when when these are the results are saved uh, in the real time on the disk that you have given to the best toolbox and uh, these settings can be particular to the experiment or subject depending on on your user requirement so upon these buttons the load uh, basically takes you to the selector where you can select some particularly saved files of best toolbox protocols we will explain it what do we mean by when we say best toolbox experiment and protocol and uh, by save you can also save this everything that you have been doing it here up till now we have not been doing anything so it's empty uh, close controller button would just hide this the side of the control and the designer would hide the design part which we will also come up uh, in the in the future and the results uh, button can be used to hide the results if there are any results being showing up here so let's start by loading a simple experiment that I have already prepared for you guys and, and have a look at it. How does it look like when, when it's already uh, populated with some basic experiment? So I think I will go with this basic experiment. This mat file that you were seeing before is a basic 
dot mat file of matlab and it has uh, uh, all the parameters saved in it which i actually already created for you guys so in this uh, here you see uh, two sessions on on this list and one one of the session is called empty session and the other is called example session which is populated and completely filled and as soon as you see that i go in in particular session from this list in a particular protocol in this list uh, the protocol parameters on the right side are updated so these are the brain simulation experiment specific parameters that you can change and then ultimately when you will run it, you will see that the, all the connected hardware is updated according to the parameters that are coming up. And also you will receive some input from the hardware devices that are connected. So in the, in the example uh, that demonstration uh, we will be performing, there will be multiple brain simulation uh, experiments that we will be performing including motor threshold hunting and showing you some single pulse dose response curves and paired pulse dose response curves, uh, TP measurements. And uh, then we will also take you to a real time uh, experiment and then our TMS intervention and then the dose intervention. But I will already start by showing that how we can populate one of the protocol and then I will move on to the second protocol and then we can eventually go into the running this protocol in a lab demonstration. So in order to how to create this, this session, the, the next next question that comes up in the mind is this. So here in this area you can type and this would when this is a name placeholder and once you click on this plus button this will add a session named as my third session in this list. And now this list has an empty list of print simulation protocols, but you can select from this list and whatever you select and then click on the plus button that gets added in this list. And then on the right side, you see the further windows opening up showing the details of the parameters that have to be filled up. By default, we have had selected some basic set of parameters, but uh, these are the parameters that we recommend in a very standard experiment, but definitely they are supposed to be changed when we, we run our own experimental design and studies. And similarly, you can also uh, go in further into this list and select whatever you want to measure, and uh, you can click on the plus button and then you will see that there is uh, another uh, protocol added with different set of input parameters. Now, in these input, in these different set of input parameters, we, we can go one by one to our example session and see what are these and how to fill these appropriately. What do we mean by these? I will not be able to explain every parameter in this webinar, but all of the details are available on our website. And I'm also happy to to uh, have a chat with you about what uh, as can be done in this uh, set of parameters. So another thing which which is very important from our toolbox perspective is all of these uh, brain stimulation uh, protocols that you are seeing, almost all of them we have designed in a way that they can be done in a brain state dependent manner or brain state independent manner. By brain state dependent, we mean that like real time uh, EEG triggered at the moment. And uh, by independent, we mean that uh, some open loop uh, uh, brain stimulation experiment. So all of the high level brain stimulation protocols that we have in the toolbox can be designed and then run in this manner. So for example, in the motor session hunting, obviously most of the time it is done in the brain state independent manner, but depending on the hypothesis, you can also try to do it in the brain state dependent manner. But in the most simplest case, you will do it in the brain state independent manner. So we will select independent from this drop down. Then here comes the next in the input device. In the input device, what do we mean by input device here is that which device will, will be giving input to this protocol when it will be running. 
uh, what EMG device? Will it be a near one device or, or the data will be coming from field trip buffer or, or from CED device? So that, that, that is taken care of by this dropdown, but this, this is not uh, the, the full version of it. Uh, we will go into the little bit backend story about it in a while that how, how can you select? Here it just shows you one, one device and how, but how can you populate it? And how can you furthermore uh, inform to the toolbox that I want my CED systems data to be picked up by the toolbox and then start doing some processing based on that data. And then there are some display and protocol related parameters here, which are default and we will not change these. It's, it's, it's fine to, to just keep them as it is. For example, what in what search window after time lock to the trigger, you want to search for MEP, what is the extraction period of the EMG that you want to extract because the best toolbox does not extract the continuous data from the uh, amplifier, but it extracts uh, triggered locked data and a time locked series. And uh, then there are some display parameters, uh, display associated parameters. On the right side, you see an interactive uh, table and an interactive graphical designer. Basically, this has all everything to do with the stimulation parameters. And here you see a table and it says condition one. And this, so this table and this graphical view, they are equivalent of each other. So changing one changes other and changing this. So if you are happy to play in the tabulated format, you can populate the table. Otherwise, you can also populate using this graphical interface. So how does this work? Particularly in a brain simulation experiment, we, we have multiple conditions. And then on multiple conditions, we have different number of stimulators. And on each stimulator, you have different kind of pulses within one trial. So for example, if you want to create another condition, you can click on this plus button and then another condition is created. And now if you want to, to add a stimulator to this condition, you can imagine that this, this button will, will always put up a line here and this line is an imaginary stimulator. And you can add multiple stimulators and then by selecting each stimulator, you can put up different pulses and then uh, using, using furthermore parameters in the table and on the graphical designer, you can keep going on and, and define the onset time of each pulse and the intensity that you want on each pulse and so on and so forth. However, I will just simply delete this so that because in the normal motor threshold hunting protocol, we will not do multiple conditions. Typically, we can do it. And here, uh, how many number of trials you would do in a, in a motor threshold hunting uh, pro protocol? What is the inter-trial interval? There are multiple ways to define inter-trial interval. You can also give your own vector to the best toolbox. And that can be also given starting intensity in terms of the units are given here. So they are relative if you, depending on what kind of motorcycle hunting you are doing and at what level of uh, microvolts you want to, to hunt for the threshold. And then here it comes an important tab which says stimulator. I have lost it here. And here in this drop down, you select a particular stimulator that you are interested to to fire or trigger and similarly uh, you can also play with it and you can define a lot of parameters here but the important thing is now i should take you to the hardware configuration so that we can configure our first input device and our first output device and complete this this experiment module and then move on to the next one so that we can eventually move on to the demonstration so using this button here in my mouse cursor is, you can open up hardware configuration. And this is very counterintuitive. Here you see some lists and here you see some interactive dropdowns. In, so whatever you, you do using these dropdowns and add that device, that device gets populated in these lists. And these lists are eventually shown on the front end of all of the protocols. So here you see all the input devices and here you see all of the output devices. To start with the device type, if you want to, to select input device or output device. For example, I say that, okay, I want to do the input device configuration at the moment. And then from this list, you can select a lot of options of that are currently compatible. And then you can, uh, further move to the next parameter. So depending on what device you select here, the, the mask of the 
the parameters of this this panel updates so for example at the moment in our lab we have a vtm neuro one system and uh, we will uh, control it to the boss device so we will we will be just using this uh, option and this is just a placeholder that will be basically representative of this entire setting so first i can say it's my second neuro one because i have already added one and then it's an important step to also add the layout of the of the cap that you have also on the streaming software running for example if it is a neuro one software then you can add it in the form of the xml for actichamp there is also an xml file and then for field tree buffer you can define your own um, matlab variable structure that will be representative of the layout uh, of the cap for now i will skip this because i have already configured it for the others settings so i will when i will add this device you see this device comes up here and when if we go to the front end now this device is also visible here so then you can similarly configure all other devices now let's quickly have an output device in the output devices you also have lots of options uh host pc triggered or Arduino trigger, Raspberry Pi trigger. For now, we have a Mac Venture system in this lab, and we will trigger it using the Boss device. So I will select this option, and I can call it my Venture two. And then uh, you can define COM port addresses and uh, Boss device trigger ports and input ports uh, to be able to to configure it successfully. And then as soon as you add it here, now this setting is saved and this can be linked here, and then test toolbox will will fire the both device at that particular port, and set the parameters at the stimulator using that particular particular COM port, and take the input data from the neuro one and present it to you. That's it about the model session hunting. Similarly, other protocols can also be uh, populated. For example, those response curve is a very important. Uh, Brain stimulation protocol that is used for multiple different kind of hypotheses. You can have various conditions, and uh, you can define, you can select input devices. Similarly, just as we did for threshold hunting, you can also do paired pulse protocols. Uh, as I have also shown you that there are paired pulses available in the best toolbox as well. And then you can also define the dose and response relationship for example if you if you if you select a conditioning stimulus here which you can already define uh, here in this corner of the table then you can uh, you you want your x axis of the of the in input output curve to be referenced against the conditioning stimulus and then the response function uh, is given in terms of the regressor of the condition so more detail about it can be discussed and also find it available on the website similarly in the paired pulse uh, it's just a change in the setting that you can you can use to create a paired pulse protocol then now we quickly move on to the tep measurement as you can see the masks are almost 99 percent of the time same specifically the stimulation parameters but sometimes the input parameters changes a lot depending upon what kind of visualizations you want and what kind of visualization does that protocol is offering. So for example, in tap measurement, you can also create butterfly plots of different kind of montages and different uh, display periods and topographical plots and multiple multi plots. So, so you can define all of that uh, uh, details here before actually you start using your uh, experiment in the lab. So we also have a resting state EEG measurement protocol. I will explain a bit in the detail later on about it, that why do we have it and how do we use it, but it can give you power spectrums, which are also corrected for the one over FE periodic components. Then we have a real time uh, closed loop. We can also, as I say, do in the brain state dependent manner, where you can define which frequency bands are available, uh, which frequency band you want to trigger upon, these are in compliance with, uh, with the settings in the BOSS device. At the moment, BOSS devices are uh, currently configured for like real-time uh, EG trigger TMS experiments. You can define a spatial filter and the frequency of the, of the bandpass filters, and then the 
you can define the phase of the of the oscillation that you want to trigger in each condition and you can also define the real time amplitude or the power of the oscillation that you want to trigger upon in particular trials using this uh, table ledger format then we we also offer rtms protocol basically where uh, you uh, you can use this graphical uh, interface to create a different uh, very different kind of different conditions for for rtms experiment theta bus beta bus or a very novel kind of experiment and then finally we also offer a very novel tools uh, interface with the neurofus device and you can also use this uh, intervention protocol to 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 create your your experiment uh, these were all the details about setting up the hardware devices and how you can create a multi-session multi-protocol non-invasive brain stimulation experiment and after that as i have already shown you it's already saved uh, in the real time on the disk uh, but you can also click on here and it's saved uh, at the back end in the folder in, a, in the form of the mat file and you can import that mat file in matlab and see all of these parameters and you can then also share it between your your colleagues and you can also share it on the lab computers and then just load it on the lab space toolbox and uh, then this experiment would be actually ready to go to be run by the master students or, or trainees. Uh, the, in the general setting tabs, uh, you can select if you want to apply some filters to the EMG data, which, which are depending upon your where you are and you want to save the, the, pro the figures that are created by each of the protocol uh, on the disk or not, and also what, what at what directory of your operating system you want to save all of these things. Yeah, so these are all of the details about about the best toolbox. Uh, we also have uh, an open repository and the best toolbox is uh, developed on GitHub openly. You can also visit to this page about issues and bugs and requests on, on, on our GitHub and WebLab website. Once you will go to the issues, on the best toolbox repository, you can post your requests or your questions. Then I will try to answer it and try to incorporate your your wishes into the best toolbox. And uh, yeah, if you if you feel if you have any feedback or input, you feel free to just uh, log into the GitHub and then just uh, drop an issue here, and then uh, we will quickly take care of it. Now I guess we will be. We are done with our first part of the software demonstration. Now I would actually like to move to actually running these these experiments that that we have quickly come up with. Uh, I will not run exactly same protocol, but I have a prepared protocol, so I will close this protocol, which and uh, and you, uh, open a similarly organized uh, protocol, and then we will run it. I have somewhere over here. Let me just load it. Okay, so this is a protocol that I actually wanted to run and I created it beforehand already. All right, yeah. So here in this protocol, you can see there are Two sessions, session one and session two, they are both identical in our hypothetical situation where we have to perform all of these different kind of measurements in an experiment. And I have already run uh, the session one, uh, and we have already the results from the session one. So what I will be doing is I will be starting uh, each of the protocol in 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 the session two, and then I will be intentionally stopping after each protocol. And then I will go to the session one on the same protocol and then I will load the results and, and explain what does the results look like in the end so that we don't wait for each of the, each of the protocol to, 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 to get completed. And uh, yeah, let me see if my other devices and softwares are connectedly running or not, and then we will start it. Yes, everything seems good there. 
Okay. Stephanie, I'm ready, please. Okay. So now we will be running a simple motor threshold hunting closed loop uh, procedure where uh, the starting intensity will be 40% of the MSO and we will be hunting for a 50 microvolt uh, uh, MEP. And the EMG system, EEG system will, in, will give data to best toolbox and trigger uh, lock to the trigger and then best toolbox will evaluate its amplitude and then set uh, the intensity on the simulator in a closed loop manner uh, in uh, using the adaptive uh, staircase uh, estimation method. Okay, so when I will run it, it will give me some prompts that, okay, you want to start some devices and you want to record some data from other devices. So I'm saying I have done that. And now you will see some pulses coming up and the data being showing up in the best toolbox quickly. It's a bit of time to set up and run. So now the first pulse actually happened at 40% MSO, which was a bit less for our subject. There is a little bit of MEP, but it's not very effective. So best toolbox is now increasing the intensity and setting it at the stimulator. Now, when it go to the 44% MSO, we saw a supra threshold MEP. So these graphs are actually interactive and you can use these limits and you can uh, zoom in and zoom out on the real time in these graphs in the MATLAB window when your experiment is running. And this trace basically shows the, the increase or decrease in the intensity depending upon the actual MEP size on that trial. So now best toolbox is actually trying to converge this, this trace so that we can find out uh, uh, the intensity which will give us almost 50 microvolt size of the MEP. And here you see the progress of the protocol, uh, the trial, which trial is it. So there were a total of 60 trials in this protocol, and now we, we are at the 15th trial. And what, what are the ITI for this next one, and what is the test stimulus uh, intensity? So actually, I will not complete this. I will just stop this now, and I will actually go to the session one and load the results from the previous run protocol. So now best toolbox have told me that it has stopped. Now I go back to session one and I can right click and then say load results and then best toolbox loads the results of the similar protocol that was run just a few uh, hours ago on the same subject and we can see that uh, the similar kind of Trace is also available here, and then it is on the right side. And all of the time series data is saved in the field trip uh, format on the disk as well. And here, basically, the average of approximately last 20 trials were, were taken. And this is tunable. Uh, you can define how much ever you want to give it in terms of the trials for average or what trials you want to incl include while calculating the average for threshold the calculation. Here we can see that it, first of all, diverged, and then eventually it started converging around the intensity of around approximately 64% MSO. So there we, we, there, there we, we can also uh, use this, this uh, established uh, uh, threshold that we have just measured and link it to the next protocol uh, and therefore say, okay, but not like actually write the intensities of uh, 80%, 90%, 100%, or 120% MS, RMT MSO, but just give it like, but just give it say, say okay, calculate 100% RMT intensity for me and the best toolbox takes care of everything else. For example, in the dose response curve, now if we would like to use that intensity linked in this protocol then we, in this intensity uh, simulation intensity uh, column we will not give it like fixed percentage mso of intensity but we can say it 120 percent of the percentage of the motor threshold or coupled to a particular sessions a particular protocol and then the particular parameter and then the channel that we were interested in so thereby you can do all of these fancy stuff. However, in the, in the next experiment module, 
I have prepared another dose response curve experiment, which is just single pulse uh, input output curve experiment. We are actually interested to find out uh, the inflection point. I will highlight the use of inflection point in a while after we see the results of this protocol. There are basically six conditions in this protocol. Each condition is approximately 15 trials jittered in between four to six trial each condition. And here I should put 60 back. And uh, then uh, my particular EMG and uh, input dev output devices are configured. Each of these devices almost have similar, have exactly similar pattern, okay, each of these conditions. And I also want the dose function to be my test stimulus, and I want no relationship in my ROS response function. So I am going to start the dose response curve protocol now. And here now you can see already several uh, windows showing you MEPs of different conditions. And then some other windows will show you averaged MEPs uh, and scatter plot. The first stimulation happened, the MEP of first stimulation, the peak to peak, second. So here you can see the condition number. So now at this time, the condition one happened. Now the condition six happened. So similarly, all of the conditions, uh, MEPs are basically on uh, on the screen and these uh, are also interactive so you can uh, make some particular part of the window bigger some particular part of the window smaller you can also zoom in and zoom out depending on your own y-axis x-axis limits here you see the peak to peak amplitude of the dose response curve and eventually when this protocol is completed here on this part you will see immediately uh, sigmoid fitted dose response curve here you see the progress of the protocol going on. I would not wait for the 90 trials to happen today. I will stop it and we will eventually jump to the final results of how did this experiment looked like. After stopping, best toolbox box saves figure in the disk and then it informs you that I have stopped uh, this protocol. Now I'm going back to my uh, session one, and I am going to load the results of this dose response curve protocol that I ran before. And yeah, here you see all of those conditions and also the scatter plot of the motor work potential and the fitted sigmoid, which just you, just, you get at the end of that entire 90 trials. And you also see uh, different annotations on this uh, sigmoid uh, fit. Uh, basically, it gives you the plateau of this uh, input-output curve and the inflection point. So typically, in the brain stimulation research, people have been using like 120% RMT as a fixed measure of, uh, as a fixed point of measuring any effects on motor cortical excitability. But uh, as a researcher, we actually recommend to, to not use that 120% uh, fixed uh, intensity to measure the, the effects, but, all, but instead use this inflection point that you receive after performing an input-output curve. And this inflection point is the point where basically it's more sensitive to the changes in the motor corticospinal excitability. And therefore, uh, we have calculated it and we have demonstrated it today. And we will also use this then this point in our other uh, subsequent protocols. Yeah. So this was uh, the single pulse uh, MEP dose response curve. Now I have also prepared a module where basically a paired pulse dose response curve is, is uh, estimated uh, in terms of like SICI manner. Uh, basically, six conditions are changing the uh, conditioning stimulus intensity here, as you can see. And then the seventh condition is the test stimulus alone condition. And here uh, on the dose function, I am saying that, OK, I want uh, on x-axis my conditioning stimulus when you will compute the input output curve for me. And on the response function, often we have to divide the uh, the CS plus TS condition with a TS condition. So therefore you can also define that over here. And everything else is running. I will be starting this now.
and we will see the results similar to the single pulse dose response curve, but for the paired pulse protocol. Okay. It takes a while when it starts. Yeah. So now it was the first condition, which was paired pulse, two millisecond apart, because it was a SICI protocol. And this was also SICI condition. The seventh condition is it's not SICI. I will wait for a few trials to, to get completed and then we will stop this protocol and move to the results. So here in the end, you will see the fitted uh, input output curve for this SI. CI inhibition response. Here we don't see any any particular inhibition happening except on these conditions, which is obvious. These conditions are very far away from the threshold. These conditions have conditioning stimulus very near to the threshold. So at least it's, it's looking like that there is some inhibition going on in these conditions. But uh, also you can see visually the MEPs, you can zoom in and zoom out in these MEPs, you can see the mean MEP, the latest MEP, and uh, so on and so forth. So, so this gives you a bit more control on whatever measurements you are performing and you can make better decisions. You can also suspect anything wrong uh, if something is set up wrong or wrong channels is, 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 is being detected or uh, you, you have more control over, over your entire life cycle of the study that you are performing. I think 21 trials are done. I will stop this. And immediately then we will move to the results of this paired pulse dose response curve. Okay, so load results will take me to the results that I computed on the same protocol. So here you see MEPs of different uh, conditions. This was the test alone condition, but others are like one, two, three, or they are other paired pulse condition. Here we see the scatter plot and here we see uh, an inhibition occurring when the CS goes close to the uh, threshold, but not exactly at the threshold, sub-threshold. Yeah, so here how, that's how you can calculate like SICI uh, input output curves as well in the best toolbox. Now is the part where we will basically be involving ourselves in more EEG related uh, stuff. So uh, in uh, I have also prepared a TEP module where we will be seeing uh, the TEPs uh, on motor cortex for all of the uh, 64 channels EEG. I will have to stop my input uh, device and restart it uh, to change the protocol of from EMG to EEG uh, and now I am restarting it okay that has been changed as soon as I run this in this protocol 50 trials uh, I am asking for for the best toolbox to deliver 50 trials each around two uh, second uh, the stimulation intensity is around 70 fixed. Uh, we can also link it to the previous SICI protocol inhibition point or the inflection point of the single pulse dose response curve or to the motor threshold hunting protocol. And the rest of the settings are pretty straightforward here. I am going, I'm saying that I'm, I'm going to get some visualizations that I will explain later on. Okay, so now I'm going to start it. The first trial is always, in this case, a dummy trial because it in, include some starter responses, so it will not show you any output. Yeah, so first was dummy. The second trial, you see the butterfly plot here. Um, it evoked responses of the channels averaged across the trials. This is the global mean field power, it is interact. If, and here you see the topographical plot. We can also right click and go into the X and Y limits of each and everything. And here uh, you see this uh, topographical plot. Yeah, so we will wait actually for these 50 trials to happen and, and see some 
some activity in the in any any of these channels by the TMS you know, PG response. Yeah, 20 trials are done. Only 30 are left. It's going to be computed very fastly. We see some global mean field power building up here in early time points. We can also interact with these. So we see that in some channels, there are some step components starting appearing up. In this case, you don't see the status in the table here, but in, in up here. Basically here we can see that the N100 is, is kind of more, more getting up from, from the temporal area. So here we, we are seeing more, more intense activity around 100 to 200 uh, millisecond from stimulation. This would be our roughly stimulation site. Okay, so 50 trials are done. This was just a very brief demonstration about the taps. We can do very fancy and different kind of tap hotspots search as well as tap measurements using this protocol. Also in the brain state uh, dependent manner. Then we will be moving forward to our EEG measurement protocol. Often at times when we do real-time EEG trigger TMS experiment, we have to find out the peak frequency of the ongoing oscillation which we are interested in. So in this case, I will be uh, interested in C3 motor, motor cortex, C3 area, uh, using a local C3 earth montage. So I'm interested to find out the individualized peak frequency at this time point. And then using the best toolbox, uh, we can we can do that. We can also uh, do very simple FFT based uh, power spectrum measurements and find out the, the peak frequency. Or we can also uh, use, do, use a very fancy method like Erasa and correct the one of our FA periodic components uh, that have been of very much importance in, in, in the recent times. So uh, in this protocol, uh, I am asking the best toolbox to take input from this EEG device that I have configured. Uh, I'm asking it to require for two minutes of the testing state EEG data, and then I am giving it some analysis parameters that, okay, apply this epoch size in this frequency band I'm interested in. This is the montage I am interested in. These are the filtered settings that I want to apply. And as soon as I click run best toolbox, uh, as actually they start taking data from the input device, I will just run it now. And uh, then it will not show you anything right away. It will wait for the two minute of complete resting state uh, data collection. And then eventually it will ultimately quickly uh, compute uh, the power spectrum and, and present it to you. I will not wait for two minutes. I will stop it right now here. And I will move on to the session. Oh, actually, I run it on the wrong session. I should have gone to the session too, but it's okay. You can again run it, so it's not a big problem. Uh, in the resting state EEG measurement, you can come back and load results of. It will still show you the previous because the one that you were going on was not completed. And here you see the the, the power spectrum and the peak in the alpha band that you you were interested in. From here, we can take out the individualized uh, oscillation peak, and then eventually, we well, the purpose of this is to uh, you can do it pre post of your RTMS intervention if you are interested in seeing the change in the peak frequency of particular oscillation, or you can also the most of the use case that we have it for is to then link it to the real time EG trigger TMS protocol so that the band pass filter. Uh, settings uh, can be individualized or also the spatial filter settings. 
Uh, here you see some some annotations. Uh, the peak frequency came out to be around 11.7 hertz. Then uh, in this graph in the very top left, you see the gray line. The gray line is basically the original power spectrum that uh, basically any FFT based method will, will, will give you. And this, this black line is, is the corrected uh, a periodic component that were that was obtained from the uh, Eralza method. So uh, this has been uh, recently very much uh, of very much importance that uh, one should be able to identify the aperiodic components in this one over F uh, style of the power spectrum and then then delete that from the actual power spectrum. It's still uh, uh, an ongoing uh, research, but the current state of the art methods are implemented in best toolbox so that we actually identify the right peak so that our Band pass filters are customized uh, nicely later on. Then we will move on to the real time uh, EEG triggered uh, TMS experiment, which is my favorite. Uh, here we see uh, the brain state dependent uh, drop down. In the input output device, I have EEG EMG because I will be also presenting the MEPs triggered at uh, that were obtained by triggering the peak or trough of an ongoing uh, mu oscillation in this experiment. We can also link this 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 peak frequency to the to the to the previous protocol that we were uh, running, but I will just keep it fixed. I will remember to go back to the session two and run the real time EG trigger TMS experiment. In this condition, you can only see two conditions. In one condition, we are saying to trigger at peak, and then in, then in the other condition, we are saying to trigger at the trough. Uh, how other amplitude and power based uh, threshold criterions can also be applied so that in the real time you uh, the uh, from, from the both device we 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 get the power and then we can tell the both device to trigger only the at, at a particular power in in very uh, real time precision uh, this is the real time montage and uh, and the weights of that montage that i'm interested in alpha band i am interested in so I guess I have to change the protocol in my amplifier device, and then we will be ready to start with this real-time EEG trigger protocol. Yes, now those settings have been changed. I will run this now. As soon as I run this, both device, best toolbox will take control to the both device and communicate with it about the upcoming conditions and then the real time and time sensitive part, both device takes care of it. So you see uh, the phase histogram of the ongoing uh, oscillation. Here you see the MEPs against both the conditions, and here you see some more information according to the of the amplitude of oscillation. There's some noise at the moment in the channel, but maybe we will wait for a few trials to happen. Here is the ITI distribution that uh, in the real time experiment, it is very important to know your inter trial interval because it is not pre planned. It is dependent on when the phase will be detected, actually, or when the trough will be detected, depending on your protocol. Here is the status of the protocol. The red one is triggering, supposed to trigger at peak, but at the moment it's possible that our subject uh, does not show very nice uh, oscillations just in this moment of the time. However, the device will not stop stimulating. Uh, it will just try to estimate the phase as accurately as, as possible. So what I will do is I will stop this now. OK, this experiment has been completed. And I will go to the session one and show the previous results by loading those. Yeah, so these were very nice results that I just uh, observed in the morning. And here you can see that we triggered on the peak and trough. Here you see the time locked EEG average of the particular specially filtered montage. Uh, the red. Uh, at the red time point, you see the MEPs here, and at the green time points, you, you see the MEPs over here. So all of this was possible due to the uh, algorithms uh, built by Christos Zerner in both device. 
and uh, best fuel box is fully compatible with both devices using the APIs. And uh, we are also doing very, very cool research uh, with it, like brain state dependent uh, EEG triggered research. Okay. I will go back to my, my session two. I think I am close enough in time. So I have to move on to the to the, the demonstration. So here I have just built up a very simple theta burst uh, example uh, using the best toolbox. And when I will run it, you will I you will see the the theta burst uh, getting set at the device simulating device and then uh, firing it. I would not do it on a subject. I will just keep the coil in the air, Stephanie. Right? Yeah. Okay. So we are going to run it and then we, we it's, it will be almost 40 seconds. So I will just spend 40 seconds in, in hearing some, some theta burst. Okay. I think we don't need to continue it. I can just stop it now. So this was just an example of of the theta burst that uh, we just had it in the best toolbox. We can also define your various different kind of uh, RTMS protocols using this graphical designer, and then uh, for the compatible uh, output uh, stimulating hardware, best toolbox takes takes care of everything. One important setting is, is very crucial in this kind of protocol is that uh, what is the stimulator status at the moment when you are giving the pulses to the stimulator from, from your BNC trigger? Is it, is it set at to fire single, to accept single pulses or is it set to fire a burst when you give it a single pulse? Or is it set to fire a train when you give it a single pulse? So this setting is very important. And if you have a very time sensitive trigger control on, on a PNC output using a both device or Arduino or Raspberry Pi, then uh, that's not a problem. Then, then your simulator can also accept single pulses. But if you do not have a very precise control of the PNC triggers, then you can set, for example, a particular train on, on the stimulator and then just give it a single pulse. Uh, and it, it will still be very accurate protocol. And the, uh, but the best toolbox, you can still prepare a full protocol. You will then not have to prepare only one single pulse here. You can prepare your full protocol, visualize it, and then say here, okay, I have set the train on the stimulator, just then provide rest of the information to the stimulator to take care of the rest of the things. And that's that's it about RTMS intervention protocol it can be done in independent manner, brain state independent or dependent manner. Now we will be moving forward to our uh, last protocol in the lab demonstration, which is related to transcranial ultrasound stimulation. So in this uh, demonstration, we are not combining it with TMS or with any other modality. Here you can see in the best toolbox different kind of parameters that you can set. For example, global power of the transducer, the frequency, the duty cycle, uh, the treatment time, focus of the transducer. And here we, we have configured already a, a device. We will not demonstrate it on a subject, but we have a water tank here and transducer is sitting inside this water tank and our a tooth device is right ready in front of me. As soon as I run this, the transducer will will be uh, sonicated with these parameters uh, in like every four to six seconds for almost 2012. I will move my camera to the top of, of the uh, water tank so that you can see a bubble being appearing up at the triggers times. Okay, let's move the camera now carefully. I think I have to do it very carefully. Uh, 
I have to see what my camera looks like in this. Uh, yeah, I think I have the view almost. Okay. Yeah. So now I will be running the protocol and then you will see in a while some, I have run the protocol. Okay, so we're starting the device. It was a very brief communication happening. Yeah, they were it. Umar, <clears throat> I think you need to move the camera just manually a bit closer to the surface of the water. But don't drop it, please. There was. We'll wait for a few more trials so that you can observe it. Yeah, just a few more, then should be fine. Just shows this actually triggering, right? Can't see yeah. much more. <clears throat> okay, I think that was the last one. And I will move my camera back. All right, yeah, so during those parameters where you don't have any input to show or visualize, then the previous inputs inputs just keep it there. I will just stop this uh, to intervention protocol. Yeah, that was, uh, I think, all of the input from my side. And uh, I think now we can have questions and answer session. Thanks a lot, Umer, for the demonstration. It worked out pretty well. Yes, thank, thank you, Umer. That was uh, that was really great. Um, I can see uh, very well prepared as well. Uh, that they all went smoothly, which is not always the case for live demonstrations. So yeah, uh, hats off to you for that. That was that was really smooth. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so we uh, there's a there's a few questions um, uh, popped up in the in the chat. I'm not sure if if. All of them are still here. Yes, uh, Egas, um, you asked a question. If I allow you to talk and if you have a camera connected, you'll be able to. Ask your question, let's see. No, maybe not, it didn't connect. So I, I can ask it instead. Um, so what are the um, requirements for the computer system to connect with the stimulators and input devices? Umar? Yeah, so the computer system, uh, we have tested it on like standard, normal computer PC available in the labs, which is 16 GB in the RAM and 1.5 gigahertz, that, and also a laptop. So in both of these uh, situations, it has been working smoothly. Uh, and uh, there is no hard and fast requirement for anything, I think. It will uh, not uh, run very, very like very in, at a very low speed if if uh, even if you have a GPU RAM. So there is no particular hardware requirement for for the box. Just important for the um, communication with the devices. So it depends on what you want to do. If you want to change um, simulation parameters, for example, it usually re requires. Uh, serial communication either via um, com port or, or usb depending um uh, so some laptops might not have in a uh, com port so you can even um, emulate one uh, with the usb adapter or something so that's all fine that's about the triggering as i mentioned in the beginning there um, it depends on how much precision you want to have right if you want to be able to trigger at millisecond seven millisecond precision you need to have a, a, a device like the boss device or an Arduino or something else that is taking the uh, control of this high precision tr triggering. But you can also, if just every few seconds want to have a trigger, you don't care exactly what the millisecond is delivered, you can even deliver your TTL pulse via um, a serial port or a public port of the computer. Thank you. Um, I guess I think your microphone is live now. Did that answer the question for you? Uh, 
thank you. Thank you for, are you listening? I think I, I could not uh, uh, connect, uh, uh, but uh, thank you for the reply. Thank you for the, the lecture. It was very good. I'll probably bug you for more questions on with the mail. I'll try to implement this down here. It's very interesting, very useful. Thank you. Thanks, Thank guys. Thanks for joining us. Um, Vikram next uh, has a question. Uh, we just passed the uh, virtual microphone too, but I think maybe the audio is not connected. So again, I can jump in. Um, if you set brain state to independent, uh, you should not choose BOSS triggered EEG device as the input device. Is that correct? So I. So it is not, uh, yeah, so both device can also be used in open loop uh, manner. So when you want to use both device as just a trigger generator, then you can select the brain state, in the brain state independent manner, still the both device. So it, and for example, it is uh, in our lab, a standard pulse generator. Uh, instead of uh, generating uh, output pulse from the COM ports or from the USB serial communication, therefore, I choose in this case uh, both triggered uh, EG device. But it was not uh, in many independent, uh, in all of the independent protocols, it was not meant to be uh, basically uh, using the closed loop or the, the real time uh, oscillation parts from the both device, but use its trigger generators to generate some TTL pulses in open loop manner. Okay, and Vikram, I can see you are, you have a microphone connected now, so feel free if there's a follow-up question. Yeah, can, can you uh, hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, so uh, it is perfectly in line with what uh, we are looking for, uh, for our future studies. So right now, my current study is uh, we only do the uh, TMS uh, on the clinical population, stroke and TBI. Uh, so it's right now it's just open loop. Uh, we record the MEP, we do the recruitment curve on active motor hotspot and resting motor hotspot. So my question is about, uh, is there a way to uh, configure this, this toolbox for uh, active motor hotspot where the, the person is doing some submaximal contraction of his finger movement or, and then we look at because some of the some of the clinical uh, uh, pop, uh, participants it's very difficult to get the hotspot with the uh, resting state um, emg so we ask them to you know contact the muscle like fda muscle against uh, uh, against uh, friction and uh, we do it between like 20, 15 and 25 percent and then when they are holding it at that level we trigger so that's when we are it, most of the time we are able to find the hotspot with the active but not necessarily the resting so i wanted to know whether it, there are any configuration capabilities to add that yeah i think it's a very nice interesting uh, example question that you have put up for our audience as well uh yes it is possible uh we can uh there is a tunable parameter of the em or the mep threshold so when you will be doing uh, active uh, motorcycle hunting, you will put it uh, at an acceptable level. Uh, no, the problem is uh, with the testing, we typically keep the 50 microvolt, the default uh, you know, accepted parameter. But when it comes to active, we usually keep the threshold with respect to the baseline EMG. The baseline EMG could be higher in some people, it could be lower in yeah. some other people. So we usually keep, with respect to baseline, it should be at least 0.1 uh, millivolt above the baseline. So, so then in that case, uh, I would, if I use this toolbox today for this experiment, I would do basic MEP measurement to find out the baseline. And then I will uh, use that eventual amplitude of MEP as a control parameter for the uh, like uh, MEP uh, threshold. So, um if I, may, I mean, we can, if I understood you correctly, so, so you're talking about defining the active motor threshold as a um, relative change from um, the, the EMG background, which is influenced by the tonic contraction, right? So it's going yeah. to show background noise. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and in, I know, so I myself try to avoid the active motor threshold whenever I can because it's uh, a bit ill-defined, right? But uh, I, I understand that you have to do it uh, in, in certain cases. Um, and I mean, some people just use then um, a higher MP um, threshold intensity, like 200 uh, yeah, uh, yeah. microvolts or so. Um, if it's about defining it relative to the um, baseline EMG measure, actually, so I, I think we could implement something <clears throat> um, which would make the AMT um, measurement a, a bit more objective as well, namely uh, just a, a continuous measurement of the EMG tonic contraction, right? Um, also, when you want to define 20% um, uh, pre-contraction, that's hard to tell without an objective measurement of maximal contraction beforehand, which can be yeah. done with the EMG. So um, uh, feel free to contact us. Um, we're happy to collaborate on implementing a, a more sophisticated um, active motor threshold. I mean, right now we, we have our own version of uh, EMS toolbox. <laughs> it's not as sophisticated as yours. It's just, uh, it serves the purpose for our study. And uh, it mainly uh, has the features for um, AMT and RMT and uh, recruitment curves. That's all. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with EN EEG or anything. So obviously, that is one of the future direction which I want to go, like integrating uh, EEG with uh, TMS, uh, mo more specifically the TEPs uh, that you mentioned, um, because I believe even uh, if the person cannot elicit MEPs, we can still see uh, the hypothesis is that I can still see some uh, measurable TEPs, which could probably inform something about the uh, you know intrahemispheric or interhemispheric connectivity uh, using EEG records. So uh, maybe offline I can again uh, connect with you and uh, discuss more about our recruitment and how I can uh, use your toolbox. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and uh, just for the configuration, uh, we use uh, a brain vision uh, system for EEG and uh, MAXT. So I believe both are compatible, as, as I saw in the presentation. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we will be able to, uh, I can help you in also setting up a field trip, real time buffer. We will have okay. to set up a TCP protocol for that. And mm -hmm. then we will be able to get data from your. Uh, okay. Experience. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Vikram. Uh, and then I think the last question that we have for now uh, from Myra uh, again doesn't look like the uh, audio connection has worked for you uh, yet. So I'll ask on your behalf: Can TMS pulse shapes be randomly jitted between pulses, and can MAG and more devices be used as output devices via TTL? So two questions in one minute for you. So. I think in the first part of the question, I I think it's it's a big question that I assume that by TMS pulse shape they mean biphasic or monophasic. If they mean this, then uh, I would say at the moment it's possible in principle, but at the moment it is not uh, tunable in the pulse device in the best tool box. So the thing is, it takes a while also for the device. Um, so if you have a, a McVenture device, for example, which is capable of producing both monophasic and biophasic pulses, it can actually um, change the mode. And there are also commands for that that can be implemented. But it um, it takes a while. Um, so you will need longer inter-trial intervals to be able to, uh, to change the mode, which is a limitation um, of the uh, stimulation device. Um, for the Mac and more, um, there are like um, biphasic pulses and um, and um, half pulses of a, of, a, of a biphasic wave. So there's no monophasic, and so the um, that stimulator uh, has the well. It can be triggered <clears throat> and modified in terms of intensity via analog inputs, or you uh, would need to have uh, an extra um a control device that we need to purchase uh, uh, in addition which then can communicate via usb um i think to the uh, computer this has not been implemented yet we're open to collaborate with manufacturer to implement it um but uh, i think at the moment we would not be able to change between those modes um 
Yeah, it's, it's possible in principle. That's the good thing about this modular open source toolbox. It can always be expanded, and we're happy to collaborate on, on these things. But yeah, it's, it's not in the standard repertoire. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Chill. Okay. Um, just uh, very quickly then, um, before we wrap up, uh, I will switch it over uh, to let everybody know what's coming up from the Brainbox Initiative really, really quickly. So only a few more minutes. Uh, for those of you that don't know, and this is the first time you've joined us at any uh, Brainbox Initiative activity, here's the quick summary, but you can find it all online. Uh, it's all about supporting through different activities, early career and mid-career researchers in non-invasive brain stimulation. We have more webinars coming up. Uh, next one already booked in is on the 4th of August, uh, Animal Models for Ultrasound Neuromodulation Research with Keith Murphy from Stanford. Um, and there's a whole library of previous webinars on the Brain Box Initiative website that you can uh, peruse at your leisure and, and catch up with anything that you might have missed. You can search by particular topic as well to make it easier to, to pin down what you're looking for and um, yeah, make use of those free resources that are available. Uh, they, they're quite uh, useful for different applications. If you're interested in finding more about uh, the specific techniques like TMS or TES, we have um, a long experience now of running practical hands-on workshops uh, covering fundamentals and applications of each of these techniques and others, including ultrasound and combined TMS EEG. Um, over the last year or so, that in-person type event hasn't been possible. So we've got a, re a good online uh, program that we've run a couple of times this year already and the next set are coming up uh, towards the end of the year, as well as another, as, as well as another ultrasound uh, workshop as well. So, uh, yeah, you can find out the details of that on our website. And uh, if you need to, are interested in finding out more about either of the techniques or any of those, then it's um, a great place to learn more. Um, and coming up in September, we have our next Brainbox Initiative conference. Uh, the speakers uh, list is growing very quickly and uh, is, is going to be a, a really great program across four days uh, in the afternoon UK time across four days covering all of these NIBS topics as well as imaging. Uh, as you can see on the previous slide, um, uh, registration is really, really cheap. Uh, it's all online again this year uh, and we try and make as, as much opportunity for interactive uh, discussion and conversation, uh, which would normally be the case in the in-person conference that we've had previous in previous years. Um, Call for posters is currently uh, still open. So if anybody has any uh, late breaking research or even planned work, obviously null results as well are also welcome. Um, please do uh, submit your uh, abstracts. Uh, Umair, as it happens, was one of the poster presenters at last year's conference, as well as one of the poster winners, poster prize winners at last year's conference. Um, and this one of the reasons why we've Kind of roped him back into the Brainbox Initiative, thankfully with uh, with Till's support as well to um, to deliver today's webinar. So uh, through the Brainbox Initiative and the conference in particular, we do try and open up as many doors and opportunities for especially early career researchers to present themselves, their work, and uh, distribute that to as wide an audience as possible. Um, all of that's possible thanks to the support from from. Brainbox, the company uh, where we supply and support all of these non-invasive brain simulation uh, solutions and, and imaging solutions. And currently, at the moment, we have a vacancy for a research specialist to join the team. It's a full-time position based at our office in Cardiff in the UK. Um, you can find full details on the Brainbox uh, website and through all of our social media channels and so on. Closing date for that is the end of August, no, the 5th of September. Um, so just, at, just after the end of August. Um, so yeah, if, if, you're, if you're looking for potentially a, a, an opportunity outside of academia, but still very closely linked, it could be uh, a great uh, career choice for you.
so yeah, take a look at the details and and do send us your application if uh, if it would suit what you're looking for and what you're looking to do. So um, uh, uh, just a quick question maybe is popped in. No, uh, we have answered all those questions. Good, I think. Um, yeah, if, if we haven't, if there are any other questions, um, as Till and Umair already said, um, there are ways to get in touch with them via the Best Toolbox website, uh, which we'll again share through the Brainbox Initiative. You can always contact us at Brainbox Initiative as well uh, if you have suggestions for other webinars, if you'd like to put yourself forward, um, uh, or for any other support that you might need. Uh, just. Uh, leaves me to thank you very much everybody for attending but also of course thank you very much both Till and Umay for your time preparing for today and delivering such a, uh, a great web webinar for us um, I think that would, would have been very useful for everyone and uh, for more people as well once we get it uploaded to the uh, to the YouTube channel for Brainbox so yeah th thanks again both of you uh, from all of us here thanks again for for having us i hope you enjoyed it uh, and uh, we're uh, happy to see the the user community uh, grow and, and flourish so yeah definitely i think that they they will uh sit well there certainly should be uh, um a growing number of users for for the toolbox uh, we've, we've seen it develop a, a lot recently and uh, yeah we can see certainly from our side the benefits of and the flexibility of it for these integrated studies as well um, which is which is a, a really valuable toolbox from that point of view thank you all and Great. See, you yeah. soon, huh? see you all next time hopefully it won't be too long before we can see you all in person but in the meantime we'll see you at the next online event um and yeah take care thanks take care. Bye. thank you bye, bye.